Of all the empires that ever arose in the ancient Near East, Persia's was the greatest. It encompassed more territory than any previous empire ever had, and more than any subsequent empire ever would, until the rise of the Arab Caliphate. Only Alexander's empire rivaled its extent, but his empire barely outlasted his death. The Persian Empire survived for two centuries. At its greatest, that empire sprawled across more than 3,000 miles of territory, from North Africa and the Balkans to Central Asia and the Valley of the Indus River. It included a dizzying array of peoples, faiths, cultures, and languages at every level of sophistication and primitiveness. Presiding over such a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual realm for as long as they did, the Persians pioneered a singularly successful model for ruling diversity without tyrannizing it. Theirs was a system that emphasized local autonomy within imperial unity. They regarded differences among beliefs and customs and languages as a part of the human condition, not some primal defect to be remedied. So, ruling with a light hand, the Persian Empire was less troubled by revolts than most previous Near Eastern realms. Only the Greeks, Babylonians, and Egyptians consistently resisted Persian rule. Motivated by their intense self-awareness and their determination to express that self-awareness through political independence and not mere autonomy, the empire's other peoples were better adjusted and more content. Our understanding of the history and character of the Persian Empire is deeply colored by the nature of our sources. Those sources are far less plentiful and very different in nature than the ones for other Near Eastern empires. First of all, we have very little cuneiform material. There are a couple of caches of administrative texts from the Persian capital of Persepolis, written in Aramaic, which was the universal language of Persian imperial administration, all told about 2,500 of them. They deal with various aspects of agricultural and labor organization, land holding, demography, diet, and travel. This is interesting material, but it doesn't tell us much about imperial affairs. The texts are also limited in their chronological scope. They only cover the period from about 510 down to 458 BC. There's also a cache of cuneiform texts from Nimrud containing the archives of a Babylonian merchant family that leased royal lands to soldiers and high court personnel. But these are basically private business records, and their horizon is limited to a particular locale. Why the cuneiform texts peter out after the mid-5th century BC isn't immediately clear. It may be that the Persians moved away from clay tablets to papyrus for their record keeping. If so, they started a general shift in the same direction because both clay tablets and the cuneiform script disappear entirely from use by the middle of the first century AD. Besides these small cuneiform collections, there are also several caches of papyri from Egypt that date to the Persian period. Being perishable, papyrus survives in Egypt's arid climate, but not elsewhere. One of these caches is a trove of records and letters left by a colony of Jewish soldiers serving the Persians at Elephantine. Another is a cache of administrative texts from Saqqara, but it was recovered from the antiquities market in damaged condition, and both its condition and its provenance compromise its usefulness to scholars. Neither of these collections casts much light on anything but its own small corner of the Persian world. The epigraphic evidence is limited too, both in quantity and scope. Persian kings occasionally put up monumental inscriptions, usually in Old Persian, the Persian's native language, which is a member of the Indo-European language family, along with Greek, Latin, and English. The best known is Darius I's monumental autobiographical inscription carved on a rock face at Behistun, which narrates the circumstances that led to his accession. But most royal inscriptions give us much less historical information than the Behistun text, and that makes them less useful than we would like them to be for reconstructing Persia's history. The Hebrew scriptures are another source. Judea was the sub-province of Yehud, in the Persian Empire, so the Jewish texts deal with the Persians insofar as they involve themselves in Jewish affairs. Of the texts in the Hebrew Scriptures, Isaiah, Ezra, and Nehemiah all cast a favorable light on the Persians. Only in Esther do we find a more negative Persian picture. But it's the Greek authors who provide our most abundant material on Persia. They give us rich, detailed, and often colorful narratives of Persian history, and vivid sketches of figures 
in Persian history. This means that thanks to the Greeks, in Persia's case alone, among the empires of the ancient Near East, are we able to describe political, military, and cultural events in detail. And it also means that our account of the Persian Empire is much longer than our accounts of other Near Eastern empires. But the Greek authors' interests are specialized. For the most part, they focus on Greco-Persian issues and on those parts of the Persian Empire where the Greeks came in contact with Persia, such as Anatolia and the Eastern Mediterranean. This means that, what we, that we know a fair bit about what went on in those areas, but we know almost nothing about what went on elsewhere. The source problem even has its own name. It's called Hellenocentrism. Most importantly, Greek writers display a strong bias in their writing about the Persians. They paint the Persians in morally unflattering terms in order to contrast them with their own image of themselves as manly, virtuous, and self-sufficient. Here's the warning that the noted Near Eastern historian Amelia Kurt gives us in her book, The Ancient Near East. Quote, All the Greek writers were fascinated by the wealth and power of the Persian rulers. So they often recount stories of court intrigue and the moral decadence that comes from living in unlimited luxury. In such anecdotes, the Persian king appears as an essentially weak figure, a prey to the machinations of powerful women and sinister eunuchs. This is an inversion of Greek social and political norms with which we as Europeans have usually identified. The image of the cowardly, effeminate Persian monarch has exercised a strong influence through the centuries, making the Persian Empire into a powerful other in European Orientalism, contrasted with Western bravery and masculinity. We must remember this in studying the Persian Empire. The powerful and widespread impression of its political system is fundamentally flawed. End quote. In his history of the ancient Near East, Mark van de Meerup seconds Court's warning, cautioning us also to beware of the classical writer's depiction of the Persian Empire as doomed and disintegrating as a consequence of its intrigues and the decadent addiction to excessive wealth. Archaeology has contributed much less to our understanding of Persia than it has both to other areas of the Near East and the Greco-Roman world. Many important Persian-era sites are today densely inhabited cities, and that, of course, gets in the way of excavation, although, of course, that hasn't stopped excavation in other densely inhabited places like Jerusalem. But perhaps more importantly, Persian excavation projects don't excite the interest, and therefore the funding, that other projects do. Very few Persian sites have any direct connection to biblical incidents or personalities. And Westerners who fund excavations don't feel the sort of cultural connection to Persia that they do with Greece and Rome. This means that what we know about Persia and what we can say is fundamentally limited by the peculiar perspectives and biases of sources that tell a compelling tale, but a tale of which we must always be skeptical. We see Persia through Greek eyes, not through Persian ones. And in fairness to the great people who were the ancient Persians, we must never forget that. The origins of the Persians lie in the vast migration of Indo-European peoples, spreading east from their homeland in the vicinity of the Black Sea. The Persians were part of the Iranian branch of this migration. The early Iranians were cattle herders who gradually moved from Central Asia into the Iranian plateau. The Persians' ancestors settled in southwestern Iran, in Persis, the modern Fars. But we hear nothing definite about either the Persians or their principality before the 7th century BC. The stage for the rise of Persia was set by the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal's destruction of Elam in 646. When Assyria crushed Elam, a local Persian dynasty was able to establish both Persis' independence and its own authority. At the same time, the Iranian pastoralists in southwestern Iran were slowly settling down and becoming farmers and townsmen. Persis is also known as Anshan, a name which is derived from the area's main city. Anshan lay deserted between about 1000 and about 700 BC, but afterwards there was a revival of urban life there and elsewhere in Persis. The earliest appearance of Anshan is in the titles of Persian kings, beginning with Cyrus, who, with his predecessors, Cambyses I, Cyrus I, and Teispes, is called King of Anshan. 
While the Persians were settling in southwestern Iran, another group of migrating Iranians closely related to them settled in the northern and central Zagros, around Ekbatna, modern Hamadan, where they became known as the Medes. The Medes first appear in Assyrian records in the 9th century BC and came to play an increasingly important role in the history of the Near East over the next three centuries. They developed a complex relationship with the Assyrians. They served in the Assyrian army as mercenaries. More often, they fought with the Assyrians, raiding Assyrian lands and suffering retaliatory attacks in return. The Medes' most dramatic achievement was their central role in the destruction of the Assyrian Empire. The traditional view has been that the Medes created a regional empire of their own that preceded the Persians. But lately, this view has been strongly challenged. The foundation of the traditional view lies in Herodotus' account of the history of the Median royal house. Critical scholars are now inclined to see this as a potpourri of legends woven into a sort of Median national folk epic by Herodotus. The Assyrian evidence doesn't support the existence of a Median empire, even though the historicity of a couple of Median kings is demonstrated by Babylonian records. And archaeological evidence for a, Med for a Median state is also very sketchy. There are palace-type structures at a handful of sites, but nothing from the supposed Median capital at Ekbatana, and all of the sites declined drastically by the 6th century BC. So it may be that Assyrian trade through the Medes' territory brought the mountain dwellers' prosperity for the fall of Assyria, which then resulted in a precipitous decline. The challenge for historians is to ferret out the actual history of the Medes. Herodotus tells us the story of four kings of the Medes. Deoches was the first king of the Medes. Before him, Herodotus says, they were village dwellers, or in Greek terms, uncivilized. Deoches was just and incorruptible, and according to Herodotus' account, became king because he was called on so often to resolve his countrymen's disputes that he said they would have to make him their king and build him a great city for a capital. That city was Ekbatana. He ruled for 43 years. The second king of the Medes was Freortes. He was said to have made the Persians his subjects and then conquered Asia, which clearly he did not do. He reigned for 22 years and was killed in battle against the Assyrians. Freortes was succeeded by his son, Cyaxares. Cyaxares reorganized the Median army, probably in response to the defeat that killed his father, separating the spearmen, archers, and cavalry into distinct units, whereas previously they'd all fought together. Cyaxares used this restructured army to help in the destruction of the hated Assyrians and reigned for 40 years. The last king of the Medes was Cyaxares' son, Astyages. Astyages reigned for 35 years and was overthrown by Cyrus the Persian when Cyrus destroyed the Median kingdom. The only Median kings who are well documented in non-Greek sources are Cyaxares and Astyages. The Babylonian chronicle named Cyaxares as the Median ruler who allied with Nabonidus to destroy Assyria, and it names Astyages as the king defeated and dethroned by Cyrus. Although Herodotus' account of the Median kingdom is more legend than history, it's clear that the Medes had become a unified kingdom by the late 7th century. For one thing, only the considerable resources made available by a unified kingdom could have enabled Cyaxares to play the role he did in the destruction of Assyria. Furthermore, Cyrus needed only a single battle to destroy the Median kingdom in 550. Had they not been a unified kingdom, his task would have been far more complicated. But whether the Medes ever created an empire that stretched from Iran all the way to the Halys River in Anatolia, is very doubtful. The creation of the Persian Empire was the work of Kurush, or Cyrus II, whom history justly remembers as Cyrus the Great. In less than 30 years, between his accession in 559 and his death in 530, he turned Persia from a peripheral Iranian principality into the greatest empire the Near East had ever known. Inevitably, Cyrus' brilliant achievements led to the creation of legends about his birth and background. These are typical of the stories that developed around ancient culture heroes like Sargon the Great, Moses, and Romulus and Remus. One legend had it that he was born of poor, humble parents and worked his way up through the ranks of the Median court until he overthrew the king. Herodotus gives his own typically charming and colorful account of Cyrus' birth and early childhood. According to him, Cyrus' mother was Mondane, Astyages' daughter, whom he had married to Cambyses, the king of Anshan. 
Astyages had a dream that the child whom she bore would become king. So he ordered his servant Harpagus to kill the infant, who passed off the loathsome duty to the royal shepherd, Mithridates, whose wife begged him to substitute her own stillborn child for the royal infant, and so they raised the infant Cyrus as their own. At the age of 10, during a game with other boys, he was chosen as king and beat an aristocratic boy who refused his orders. When the boy's father complained to Astyages and Cyrus was brought before the king, he defended his actions and Astyages intuitively recognized Cyrus as having royal blood and figured out who he must be. When Mithridates revealed the truth under torture, Astyages cruelly punished Harpagus by butchering Harpagus' son and then serving the lad's cooked remains to the unwitting Harpagus as a royal meal. Astyages allowed Cyrus to return to Cambyses in Mandani, though, because in the opinion of his soothsayers, the Magi, Cyrus's having been called king by the boys fulfilled the terms of Astyages' dream. Which just goes to show how wrong a guy can be, because to avenge himself on Astyages, once Cyrus was on the throne of Persis or Anshan, Harpagus revealed Astyages' original purpose to Cyrus and encouraged Cyrus to revolt. According to Cyrus' own testimony, he was the fourth generation of his family to sit on the throne of Persis or Anshan. In the genealogies, the founder of the dynasty was his great-grandfather Teispes, who reigned around 650 B.C. Teispes' successor was Cyrus I, who was followed on the throne by his son, Cambyses I, who was Cyrus the Great's father. The Syrian records prove the existence of Cyrus I because they record him sending tribute to Ashurbanipal around 640. In a variant form of the genealogy, given by Darius I on his Behistun inscription, Teispes' son was Ariamnes. Most scholars think Teispes had two sons, Ariamnes and Cyrus I, and that Anshan and Persis were separate principalities ruled by Cyrus and Ariamnes respectively. But no evidence directly supports the existence of these separate principalities at that time. In any case, Darius claimed descent from Ariamnes and was at pains to associate his own family, the Achaemenids, with the line of Cyrus. The first step in Cyrus' creation of the Persian Empire came in 550, with his destruction of the kingdom of the Medes. Persia's relationship to the Median kingdom prior to Cyrus is unclear. There's no evidence that directly supports Herodotus' contention that Persia was a vassal state of the Medes. When Cyrus defeated Astyages, when Astyages' army mutinied on the eve of battle and handed Astyages over to Cyrus, who then kept the fallen Mede in polite but secure captivity at the Persian court. Defeating Astyages vastly increased Cyrus's material and manpower resources and also made him heir to whatever regional hegemony the Median kingdom might have exercised. Cyrus next turned his attention to western Anatolia, where in 547 Croesus, King of Lydia attempted to capitalize on Cyrus' destruction of the Medes by enlarging his own kingdom. When the Persians and Lydians met in battle, perhaps near the site of Hattashas, Croesus fought Cyrus to a draw. Satisfied that he had fended off the Persians, at least for the moment, Croesus disbanded his army for the winter and sent requests for aid to Egypt, Babylonia, and Sparta. The Persians were mountain folk and used to winter weather, so Cyrus remained in the field and marched on Croesus' capital at Sardis. He also sent messengers to the Greek cities on the western shore of Anatolia, the region known as Ionia, to encourage them to join him by rebelling, but they refused. Cyrus laid siege to Sardis in the winter of 546. The city fell after two weeks, and with it, the kingdom of Lydia came to an end. The traditions about Croesus' fate are contradictory. The Nabonidus Chronicle from Babylonia implies that he was killed. According to Herodotus, though, Croesus became a trusted advisor at the Persian court after his life was miraculously saved, either spared from being killed by a Persian soldier, when a previously mute boy suddenly cried out to the soldier to spare Croesus, or when a miraculous torrent of rain doused a pyre on which Croesus was about to immolate himself. But Cyrus' treatment of defeated rivals was singularly generous, so the notion that Croesus, like Astyages, was spared and given an honorable retirement has both emotional appeal and historical merit. Victorious over Lydia, Cyrus went on to subjugate the Greek city-states of Ionia, 
marking the first fateful encounter between Persia and the Greeks. This time, the Persians won. He placed Western Anatolia under direct Persian rule, but almost immediately had to put down a rebellion. He had appointed a local official, Pactias, to act as treasurer in Western Anatolia under the command of the Persian general Tabalus, who was left in Sardis with a garrison force. Pactias ran off with the funds and raised a revolt with some backing from the Ionian Greeks. Cyrus responded swiftly and harshly by sending his general Mazares to pursue the rebel, who was turned over to the Persians by the Aegean city-state of Chios. The Persians made an example of some of the Greek cities which had aided the rebellion and then completed the conquest of the city-states of western and southern Anatolia. Mazare sacked Priene, sold its inhabitants into slavery, and ravaged the plain of the Meander River. Harpagus took over the Persian command after Mazare's death and subjugated the Greek cities of Caria, Caunia, and Lycia. Some submitted peacefully, others had to be besieged. Half of the population of Phocea simply took ship and fled to their colony of Alalia on Corsica, where they joined the fight against Carthage for control of the island. Once Anatolia was secure, Cyrus finally turned his attention to Babylonia. Neo-Babylonians still controlled an empire that stretched from the Persian Gulf to Palestine. Their hints of fighting between the Neo-Babylonians and Persia prior to the final Persian attack, but Cyrus' invasion also reflected the geopolitical dynamics of the region. Hostility between the powers that dominated Mesopotamia and those that dominated western Iran, the Armenian highlands, and Anatolia was a tradition that stretched back nearly 2,000 years. But Babylonia had also been allied with Lydia, and Cyrus' conquest of Lydia may have been the pretext for the outbreak of hostilities. Whatever it was when he moved, Cyrus moved decisively. At the Battle of Opus in 539, he destroyed the Neo-Babylonian kingdom with one swift blow, slaughtering its army. The communities of Mesopotamia rushed to submit to him. The Neo-Babylonian king, Nabonidus, fled to Babylon, where he was taken prisoner as the populace formally welcomed Cyrus into the capital as their new king. Cyrus then cast himself as the divinely sanctioned restorer of Babylonia, commissioned a program of civic and sacred building construction, proclaiming the restoration of destroyed sanctuaries and the return of their peoples. It was as part of this program of restoration that he sent the exiles back to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity and commissioned the reconstruction of the temple for which Isaiah 45 verse 1 hails him as the Messiah. This was all part of the customary public rhetoric of Babylonian conquerors after a triumph, which guaranteed continuity to the defeated and offered the local elites political cover for collaborating with the victor. Cyrus's obliteration of the Neo-Babylonian army and government gave him control over territories that extended from the frontiers of Egypt to the Zagros foothills. He moved quickly to install people whom he trusted in control of Babylonia, but avoided taking the royal title himself. Insofar as possible, he left local affairs in native hands. At first, he installed his son, Cambyses, as king in Babylonia. For reasons that aren't clear, after a year, he replaced Cambyses with a general named Gobrius as governor. But below the highest echelons, Cyrus retained local Babylonian officials in their posts, a policy which appears to have worked well. There are no hints of the local unrest that had plagued the Assyrians in Babylonia, much less of the sort of open revolt found in Lydia. What measures Cyrus took for the former provinces of the Neo-Babylonian Empire are less clear. The return of the exiles to Jerusalem may hint at a general effort by Persia to restore and strengthen provincial centers in the old Babylonian provinces. Like Astyages and Croesus, Nabonidus was a beneficiary of Cyrus' singular generosity toward former enemies. He became an exile, living on an estate in Carmania in southern Iran for the rest of his life. After the fall of Babylon, Cyrus created a new capital for his empire at Pasargade. The city was located about 50 miles northeast of the city of Anshan. It's named for the tribe Cyrus belonged to. The style of its buildings was eclectic and imperial. They incorporated Assyrian, Iranian, and even Greek techniques and motifs. So, in Pazargade, Cyrus created a fitting symbol for the breadth and diversity of his vision of the empire. An empire ruled by Persians, but home to all the peoples of the ancient Near East. Having secured Babylonia in the west, Cyrus turned his attention to eastern Iran and Central Asia. 
Lying far beyond Greek horizons and of little interest to them, this is the least well-documented part of Cyrus' activity. Greek writers credit Cyrus with the conquest of Bactria and Sogdiana as far as the Jaxartes River. A string of Persian forts built along the Jaxartes includes Siriscata, whose foundation was later linked to Cyrus. Though it's not clear how much of the region he actually conquered, it looks as though he brought most of Afghanistan and South Central Asia under some sort of Persian control. Then, in 530, while fighting the nomadic Masagitai, who lived in Central Asia beyond the Jaxartes, Cyrus the Great was killed in battle. Cyrus's son Cambyses succeeded him on the throne. Cambyses continued the expansion of the empire by conquering Egypt. King Amasis of Egypt had actively supported Cyrus's opponents and taken steps to strengthen Egypt's position vis-a-vis -vis Persia. He allied with Polycrates of Samos as a balance against Persia's control of Ionia. He also conquered Cyprus to check Persian control of the Levant. Cambyses carefully laid the groundwork for the Persian invasion of Egypt by doing three things. Building a fleet to counter Egypt's naval supremacy, taking Egypt's outposts, and securing the invasion routes across the Sinai. His navy consisted of the cutting-edge triremes, which were top-of-the-line warships propelled in combat by three vertical banks of oars. The ships were crewed by Persia's maritime subjects, but the commanders were all Persians. He also took Cyprus from Egypt to prevent its use as a base against Persian bases in the Levant. And he established diplomatic links with the Arab tribes that controlled the routes through the desert. He launched his attack on Egypt in 526. Victory was swift. The Persians defeated the Egyptian army in a battle on the easternmost branch of the Nile Delta, and the Egyptians fell back to the fortress of Memphis. They murdered the Persian herald sent to summon them to surrender, and the Persians besieged and took Memphis after ten days. The new Egyptian king, Semeticus III, was taken prisoner. The peoples of Libya, Barca, and Cyrenaica quickly approached the Persians with offers of submission. Cambyses then consolidated Egypt's southern frontier by making an arrangement with the Napadan kings who ruled beyond the first cataract. Cambyses may also have secured the routes across the eastern Sahara by conquering the Egyptian outpost at the Karga Oasis. Herodotus gives us a biased portrait of Cambyses, depicting him as a paranoid tyrant. The truth appears to have been different. His picture is grounded in hostile Egyptian propaganda from the mid-5th century BC. Egyptian sources contemporary with the conquest see Cambyses much differently. What happened to color our sources? By Herodotus' time, Egyptian attitudes toward Persian rule had soured, thanks to the burden of Persian taxation and the ruthless suppression of two Egyptian revolts in 486-485 and 460-453. It was also the loss of status and property suffered by those who backed the losing side in these two rebellions. In point of fact, Cambyses' policy towards Egypt mirrored Cyrus' policy in Babylonia. He forged links with the local elites and installed them in honored but not politically powerful positions, using their familiarity with local conditions to make acceptance of Persian rule palatable, and he honored and respected local religious cults with their powerful and influential priesthoods. While Cambyses was consolidating his control of Egypt, there was a severe political crisis back home, in the course of which he came to an untimely end. According to the account left by the next king, Darius the Achaemenid, Cambyses secretly murdered his brother, Bardia, or Smerdis, as Herodotus calls him. An impostor, Galmata the Magian, then arose, posing as Smerdis, and the entire empire rallied to his side against Cambyses, who died of an accidental wound in Syria while returning to defend his throne. Darius, after praying to the one god Ahura Mazda, led a group of great Persian barons against Galmata and killed him, after which Ahura Mazda bestowed the kingship on Darius. It may be likelier that what actually happened was that Bardia took advantage of discontent with his brother's prolonged absence in Egypt to usurp the throne, and that he was then murdered by an aristocratic conspiracy led by Darius. Cambyses' death brought an end to Cyrus's dynasty, and Darius' accession ushered in both a new family, the Achaemenids, and a new era in Persia's imperial history. 
when the empire achieved its final form and met its mortal enemy, the Greeks.